Welcome back to Sahara TV. My name is Rudolf Okonko. We are continuing our discussion on the life and legacy of Chinua Achebe. Over 50 years ago, Achebe wrote, Okonko was well known throughout the nine villages and even beyond. And with that, he started Things Hold Apart, a novel that is uncomparable to any other novel published by an African. It has sold over 10 million copies worldwide. With me today is somebody who knows Achebe very well. Um, he's Dr. Chidon Wangu. He's the publisher of US Africa Online. He was the moderator of the last Achebe Colloquium at Brown University. Chido, welcome to Sahara TV. Thank you very much. Now, let me start by asking you, where were you when you had the news that Achebe passed away? Okay. I was um, at home here in Texas. Okay. How did you receive the news? Uh, with um, a lot of... Um, anguish and um, pain at the sense of the loss, uh, Can you hear me a now? realistic assessment of um, the fact that one of the greatest uh, persons of African descent, you know, had um, moved on in terms of uh, his life. Now, Chido, hold on there, because I understand that Professor Olu Ogibe just joined us. Uh, Professor Ogibe, welcome to Sahara TV. Are you welcome? Now, Ologibe is a professor of arts and African American studies at the University of Connecticut. Uh, I was talking to Chido. I was trying to find out where he was when he got the news that Chinuachiwe passed away. And where were you, and how did you get the news, uh, uh, Professor Ogibe? Uh, what's interesting is that it became as rumor first. Uh, there was something in the newspapers uh, on the twenty-first, um, I believe. Uh, the refutation on the 21st. I read that somewhere with some on, on some uh, listserv. And uh, a Nigerian newspaper had been in touch with the family, and they refuted the rumor on the 21st and said that he'd been in hospital, but he hadn't passed away yet. Um, and then the following morning, uh, I got quite a few calls. I don't recall who exactly called me, or maybe they sent me text messages. At that point, I had to reconfirm with others to uh, know what the situation is, because the, the previous day there was a refutation, and the following morning there was a, a confirmation in the newspapers, especially UK newspapers, that um, they had passed on. Now, Chido, you were a moderator at the last Achebe Colloquium. I, I believe you, you, you know Achebe beyond the, the person we see or people read about. How do you describe him, Achebe the man? In a word, simply great. Very distinguished. Very humble. Very accessible. And two color force you know, like his sons, and um, a man whose decency uh, is a towering example for, for many in the world. You know, um, he's a man who uh, remembers so much of everything, of, of, of things that are important. A man whose courage is not dramatic. A man who does not wear his intentions on his sleeves, but is certain to deliver his message, no matter whose ox is God. Mm. Um, a man evidently and clearly uh, had the dedication of a father, you know, uh, in raising very outstanding uh, children, and um, a man uh, loved by his uh, uh, very dutiful wife, uh, Professor Christy Achebe, uh, sometimes, uh, I think your question is very important. Sometimes we look at the, the message, the, the writings of Achebe, you know, uh, forgetting that the strength of his personality and of his character is evident in his family dedication, in his family values, in his uh, persistence uh, on focusing on the things that are important, believing that the rest of it will be uh, examples uh, for the rest of the world uh, or the rest of the community. Uh, 
to learn from without setting out to say, you know what, I'm going to do this, you know, but um, as you know, a man who is known as Eagle on the Roko is a man who sees so much, mm. does not just move on any kind of tree, but at the topmost tree in the community. Yeah, uh, Professor Ogibe, let me come to you. Um, when was the last time you saw Achebe and his passing? How do you see it? As, what's the significance of, of Achebe's passing? Oh, I saw him last not very long ago. Uh, I don't recall exactly because I've been to the family house a couple of times in, in the past few months. Um, uh, so it might have been earlier this year. It might have been in January. It might have been in December. Um, and uh, it was not easy to tell at the time uh, that his health would deteriorate so uh, quickly after that. Um, and I saw him also at the uh, Achebe Club, the last Achebe Club at Brown University. He was able to put in an appearance, and uh, we went over to his place afterwards. Uh, as to your, your second question, could you repeat that, please? I no, I was saying the significance of, of his passing, especially in, in light of what he represents, the generation of, of writers who, who saw the colonial masters and saw Nigeria's independence and had this hope for Africa and, and what Africa has turned out to look like now. Well, I think one thing that's important to, uh, to acknowledge is that he did, uh, he did um, dispatch his task quite um, comfortably. He was able to tell his story, as I was uh, trying to explain a little later on when uh, we had a, a private conversation off air. Uh, he told the story of the race over a whole century, beginning in the 19th century into the late 20th century. And he did not just do that in fiction. He also did it in terms of criticism, in terms of philosophy, in terms of, of activism, in all sorts of ways. So. Uh, as a man, and, and at the end of the day, he was one man, uh, was able to dispatch his duties uh, very comfortably. At the same time, whenever a man of that stature, or any man whatsoever, has a gun, they take with them so many stories. Now, I can illustrate that on a very personal level. Uh, the last time um, that I, although I don't recall exactly when it was, but the last time I was at the home in he was there as well, because I do go down to occasionally, and he's not able to come downstairs uh, because he's busy or he's not in very good health. But the last time that he was able to come downstairs, we had a chat, uh, and we talked about his book very briefly. Uh, that's uh, uh, Tales of Country. And I said to him that I would like for us to talk some more about the book because I have lots of questions about that period about that experience, uh, about things that may not have been covered, and there was a country. And he said to me that he would be very delighted to do that. And then, you know, he turned around, uh, this is pretty late in the evening, he turned around and said to me uh, that uh, he came down to see me, and now that he'd seen me, that he would uh, he thought he'd retire for the day. And that, that was the last time I saw him. So we were not able to have that conversation about all the other additional stories regarding the experience of the Civil War that he carries with him. And that's, that's a huge loss to me personally. And I think that's a loss to all of us uh, because I had things to ask him uh, which probably would have expatiated in some of the controversies that arose from his telling of that story, and that's not possible now. That's what happens when... Uh, yeah, Professor Ogibe, can you share one of the questions you had for him uh, about, about the book, please? Well, I think that um, uh, there's, there's an element, it's, it's a very generous book. I think that's been very misunderstood that people who haven't read the book, most of the critics, most of the uh, vitriolic criticism has come from people who did not read the book. Uh, when you read the book, it's actually a very generous uh, take on the experience of the uh, Eastern Nigerians and, and the Igbo um, during that period. And I would like to, uh, to ask uh, 
uh, a little more about the um, human rights aspect to the experience. Because what happened afterwards is that after the war, everything was forgotten. No one was ever brought to justice. No one was ever, ever uh, uh, called to account. You know, people simply said there was no victor and no vanquished, and, and that was it individuals who had perpetrated genocide were allowed to walk us without any consequence. I would have liked to ask what his generation felt about that, because then they had to deal with these people, you know. It, it was slightly different for me, because my experience of the war is only from the, the perspective of a child. I was not involved in all the stories and all the betrayal and all the, all the uh, uh, provocations. And I, I was not let off my job, my, my home was not stolen, and so on and so forth. So my sense of outrage was more or less inherited. But I would have liked to know how his generation felt about the fact that the people who perpetrated those atrocities went on to rule Nigeria. They went on and they jobs, they kept the houses, they stole, they, they walked the earth, and nobody ever brought to justice. Mm. That's just, just one of several questions. And, and because they were able to do that, because there was no consequence, that's why you have the bombing in Kano just the day before he passed away. Mm. Where another set of uh, people from, from, the, from eastern Nigeria have been massacred in the north. People will continue to do that as long as there's no sense of consequence because you can do that and get away with it. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I feel that his generation must have repressed so much mm. in order to continue to identify with Nigeria to the extent mm. that he in particular did it. Mm. Let me let me I can't I can't comprehend it. Mm. Let me let me go to Chido, Dr. Chido Wangwu. Let, let me ask you because you run the Achebe books and Nigeria three sixty and most people who are looking at the deaths, the passing of Achebe, are, are limited in their view of, of his life and his work. Most people are focused on, on this last book that uh, Professor Ogibe is just talking about. Uh, I want you to give us a perspective on the relevance of Achebe uh, to this moment. Uh, and you can connect it to the, the recent incident in Kano, the bombing of uh, the bus uh, park in Kano. What is the relevance of Achebe? How is, is um, this his passing uh, a, a kind of so such a moment for Nigerians and the Igbo, if, if you want? The first and foremost uh, relevance, I think, is the power and permanence of the written word, the power of the writer who is uncompromised by the allurements of power or by the attractions of seductions of corruption or just the, 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 the other issue with the relevance of Achebe is the transgenerational value of his writings. Mm -hmm. You take his um, uh, writings on things fall apart. A 10-year-old, 12-year-old kid anywhere in the world will read it and have a sense of pre-colonial Africa and uh, the dynamics of the period. And you, 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 you shuttle fast to the book, There Was a Country. It reinforces the implications of the culture of impunity, the culture of kill and go, you know, which Dr. Professor Logubia mentioned in terms of uh, the lack of a uh, consequence, you know, where people get away with all manner of uh, crimes and then uh, believe that if they sat on the top of their, of their roofs or on various media outlets and insult Achebe from now till uh, the year 3030, that is going to change the f historicity or the facts that certain acts and actions of genocidal consequence, the, the state-sponsored murder of several individuals not only in the eastern part of Nigeria, but in other parts of Africa, in other parts of the world, as chronicled by Achebe and other writers, will be wished away. 
or that if somebody threatened fire and fire and brimstone that we will all run under our tables and say, oh, no, you know, we're, we're not going to talk about it. Actually, based timing is just unmatched. Actually, based courage is unique in the history of writers who have the courage to speak their truths to the face of power. The relevance of Achebe is also built strongly in the fact that we have a man whose simple approach to life, whose lucidity in the control and use of the English language is such that his style of writing in terms of the technical structure of his relevance is a permanent feature and a permanent preference for so many uh, who read works that illuminate the mind. But the final issue of relevance that I want to speak to is the issue of the global connection of the issues that face mankind, no matter where they are in the world. Achebe does not speak only to the condition of the Biafra or the Igbo or the Niger Delta. You know, he speaks to the global human experience, and that is the strength and permanence of the man's works. You know, I can speak about his relevance for the next uh, two days. And, uh, yeah, I know. But uh, w let's move on. Uh, 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 hello, Professor Ogibe, let me ask you. Um, this, this quote from Achebe says that when suffering knocks on your door, or at your door and you say there is no seat for him, he tells you to not to worry because is, he has brought, brought his own sons too. Now, yeah. you, you, uh, you are a post-colonial theorist, yeah, sort of. Uh, and I'm not sure I'm putting it right, but you deal with post-colonial issues. My question is, the, the colonial issues that people uh, of Achebe's generation uh, try to deal with in, in Africa, is it over or is it trouble still sitting there with us? Uh, and I want you to answer this in connection with uh, today's writers. What, what their focus in is. Are they still uh, dealing with those post-colonial issues, uh, or colonial issues, uh, or are they still uh, moving on to other things? What is, what is going on? Well, I think that one of the distinctions of uh, Achebe's generation of, of writers is that they weren't simply fiction writers or poetry writers, but they were philosophers as well. So they were able to articulate theoretical issues, philosophical issues, uh, relating to the African experience in the 20th century going into the 21st and in, in the modern era. Um, I'm not quite sure that so many of the younger writers uh, possess some intellectual rigor uh, to articulate some of those questions at the same level, with the same uh, dexterity that Achebe or Wale Shoinka, for instance, uh, did. If you remember correctly, uh, in, in the period following A Man of the People, when Achebe uh, was not writing fiction, he moved quickly to essays. And uh, his essays uh, gave birth to post-colonial theory. Achebe's essays gave birth to post-colonial theory. Now, this is a novelist. Um, I'm not very familiar with that many younger writers who, especially the fiction writers, I think some of the poets uh, um, do distinguish themselves as academics and intellectuals, but many of the fiction writers uh, don't seem to have risen up to the challenge of articulating these experiences, because they're not, they're not temporal experiences, they're not things that come and go. We're still in the post-colonial era. We're still, you know, uh, dealing with post, what I call the post-colonial predicament, and part of that is it's a late post-colony, uh, with the failure of the nation states, with the need to rearticulate the very idea and foundation of the nation states that we inherited from uh, empire and, and from colonialism. That's a very present question, and that's the question behind the bombing in Cano. That's the question around the. Uh, the uh, uh, violent and vitriolic criticism of Achebe's book and Achebe's person uh, last year. It's the question of, are we supposed, really, to be part of one nation-state? 
is a solid enough foundation for all of these diverse people who were pulled together and, and forced together by empires for their own purposes? Is there enough foundation for these people to continue to exist under the same politics? Or is it necessary at this point for them to explore other alternatives, to explore other possibilities? That's a very present question. You look at the degeneration, mental degeneration of people within these failed states, the moral bankruptcy that's happening at the moment. You, 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 you realize that these are very present questions that will stay with us mm. for another generation. I mean, the question of the failure of the educational system in Nigeria is something that will haunt Nigerians for another generation or two. Mm. This is because the people that they're training now in the universities who can't spell their names, mm. these are the people who will be running the country in 20 years' time, in 30 years' time. How are they going to be able to do that? Mm. So these are very present questions. And I think that some of the writers are dealing with it. Most of the writers are dealing with it as fiction writers and as poets from a purely philosophical and intellectual point of view. I'm not saying that writing fiction or poetry is not intellectual endeavor, because it is. I'm saying that these those writers, that Chippe and Sean Kay and so on, Sean Kay has put out so many books of essays, you know, his letters just out of Africa. Uh, of Africa. Um, and I, I don't recall uh, someone like uh, Shimamanda uh, Adichie, for instance, having written any essays that come close to the, the pertinence of Achebe's philosophical endeavor. Mm. So I, I, I'm not saying that that will not happen, because these writers obviously have time on, on their side, uh, but it's still to be seen that the level of intellectual rigor exists, although the questions will remain pertinent They're with us for as long as we're alive, they'll mm. be with our children going into the future. Mm. Uh, Dr. Wangu, uh, you talked about um, Achebe, the man, and you talked about the family, the wife and the kids. And I want to ask, because in our discussion, we often um, forget the role of women uh, uh, in, in the lives of some of our, our, our writers. And, and um, in the case of Achebe, I want you to tell us a little bit about the, how women are portrayed in his work because I think it's one of the areas that we don't get it to pay a lot of attention to. Achebe, um, I recall uh, during, I believe, uh, the 2000 and 2006 uh, U.S. Africa Mother's Day event. I called him and I told him that I needed to uh, distill a word or two of wisdom from him that could become the theme of uh, the event, you know, from a philosophical standpoint. And um, he, he, he told me about Neka, that mother is supreme, you know, in terms of the Igbo cosmology of, of naming um, uh, their children, their daughters. Um, and then he spoke to the value and the, the resourcefulness of women in every culture, especially um, in the cultures of, uh, of his uh, immediate experience. In his works, uh, women are uplifted. Uh, he speaks to the progressive inclusion of uh, women in, in the structure of the society, in the structure of governance, and also in his, in his uh, various essays. And even in There Was a Country, he highlighted significantly, the role of various women, uh, including uh, especially Oibu Adenamadu and several others, uh, Margaret Ekbo and, and a couple of other leading women. So he's on the progressive side of history in terms of his articulation of the role of women in, in moving societies uh, forward. Hmm. Um, let me, let me actually, call... Actually, you know, um, um, Rudy, I'm going to speak yeah, for go, a go ahead, question go ahead. as well. Uh, because it, it did come up uh, when Western critics uh, began to say in 1986 that finally, finally, Achebe has written a book that pays attention to women. That was entirely uh, 
inanimate. Because throughout the beginning, the things fall apart. Throughout Achebe's book, women are central. On Wello, and things fall apart, that's the priestess. That's, that's the woman at the oracle. Nothing could happen in the villages without going to the priestess at the oracle. That was the woman. Is that, that was how, that how you determined the future of the world, of the village, was to go and consult this woman. Okonkwa loved his daughter. Although he had a male child, he did not believe in his male child. He, he, was, he, he felt betrayed to have had such a son. Mm. Who was the child that he loved the most? Izimma, his daughter. Mm. Now Tiva to, to uh, Antios of the Susana. And women play very, very interesting roles there. You know, um, the, 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 there's the, the journalist who plays a more negative role coming from the U.S. and there's the uh, Nigerian woman who is very powerful there too. So I, I don't think that that happened only in Antios of the Susana. It was there right from the beginning and things were apart where women were at the very center. She was a very strong willed woman. Mm. She was the one woman who could stand up to the only person, in fact, not just the, the one woman, but the only person in things fall apart who could stand up. Yeah, let, let me, wife. let me, uh, 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 Professor Ogibe, let me ask you because I'm getting to that Okonko question. And, and if, if, if I may, if I might interject. Okay, okay. Part, part of the portraiture of women in Achebe's works also reflect the existential reality of the culture and of the environment. It is not so much the interposition of Achebe's preference that in pre colonial uh, Igbo land that the women had, uh, if you will, uh, a minimal role. That there, there is a cultural contextualization of. No, 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 no. I want to accept. No, Chidi, I want to accept that because that's just a, that's an apologist position. That does not reflect the work. The work, the work shows women to be central and powerful, not not having minimal roles. No. I'm well, the priestess does not have a minimal role. She is at the center of the world. Without her, nothing can happen. You can't, you can't name a child. You can't go to war. You can't plant your yams. You can't tell your future. No matter who you are, okay, without okay, going uh, to uh, 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 that, okay. Is, that is the most central position in the novel, and that's the first novel, and mm. things fall apart. Mm. So women are not minimized at all. I think to, to go back and say, well, this was the reality that women played uh, less uh, uh, powerful roles. No, 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 it's apologist. It does not reflect the work. And, and it's an, I think it's necessary to position that properly so mm. that the name that women only became central or, or powerful, or uh, dominant, in Achebe's fiction uh, in Antios of the Savannah, mm. is refuted and dismissed because it's not correct. Mm. Okay, let, let, let's 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 let, let's go. Let's expand this discussion, and I, I, I want to because most people who are uh, already know about the Bo society is still the kind of things they're reading things all about, and some people cannot differentiate between fiction and non-fiction. And, and I was talking to somebody recently uh, after the passing of Achebe, and uh, there was a suggestion that probably, probably the, the idea that Okonkwo, Okonkwo committed suicide and probably did not reincarnate in, in the fictional world uh, could be, it may be childish, but could be interpo in, in, interpolated to mean that the, the generation of Igbo people who, who uh, are now living uh reincarnates of of unoka uh, i'm 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 framing this to you uh professor give i know i i know is it, it doesn't make much sense but i wanted to talk about the generation of uh people in 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 lights in that looks like okonkwo in Igbo land and what we have now the kind of people we have in Igbo land uh to put it in that context loosely i know it's not connected no, I think, I think that's an excellent question. That's a very important question, in fact. And that's one of the areas where I had 
a slight disagreement mm. uh, with Professor Achebe, and that was one of the questions that I would have asked him because I wanted I wanted to clear that to make sure that I was not misunderstanding him, um, and that I was not misinterpreting his position or what he intended to do to Okonkwo, because he had said on many occasions that Okonkwo was uh, headstrong. Uh, in other words, he did not possess the typical Igbo diplomacy. And people have said that to me, you know, in the past. I remember Audio Fenneman told me that once, you know, and he said, you're not, you're not a typical Igbo, you know, you're not, you're not, you're like Okonkwo, you know, you're not a typical Igbo because you're headstrong. The typical Igbo is supposed to be diplomatic, it's supposed to be accommodating, it's supposed to be accepting, and so on. And so and there's some truth to that. And my position always was that Okonkwo was the right, was in fact the right person at the onset of the colonial onslaught. He was the one person who refused to be compliant and refused to be the typical diplomatic evil, and his position turned out in the right position. Because his position was, we must not give these people ground, because if we do, they will take over. And that's what they did. So he was right. The rest of the town who said, why did he do it? He should have been, you know, like, with you know, he should be taking it easy. He's not the only person in town, you know. He's not the only evil here. They turned out to be wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I've always held Okonkwo, in spite of the fact that he's supposed to represent uh, um, a rigid, non-flexible position that was not adaptable in the face of history, I've always thought that he, in fact, was the person that we needed. The only person who could see so far into the future that when you let those people put a knife to the things that hold us together, we are definitely going to fall apart. Mm-hmm. And so the characterization of Okonkwo as the wrong man with the wrong ideas, who could not adapt, and so on and so forth. There's all sorts of truth to that, but he was also very insightful. And but I said he created the character, despite the fact that he disowned him in so many ways. Mm-hmm. It's very telling, because something else within him obviously created this character, who stood up. Mm. and would not compromise. And that, in fact, is actually that we know. That's the man who does not compromise in terms of his principles. He's very accommodating, he's very generous, he's very big diplomatic, when it, but when it comes to principles, he would not compromise himself. Mm. That mm. was a Congo. And I think that we have a generation of people now, you're very right, who are typical in the sense of being compliant, being complacent, being uh, acquiescent, and therefore watching as their world continues to fall apart. Okay. And that's uh, a tragedy. Mm. Uh, um, uh, Professor uh, Ogibe, thank you. Uh, Chido, we just have, I just, I was just told that we have like than a minute to, a, a minute to a uh, round up. Uh, let me ask you, uh, I wish we can extend this conversation for much longer because uh, you guys are giving us some, um, a lot of uh, knowledge and information. Let me ask you, how do we preserve uh, the legacy of Chino Achebe so that it could last longer than, um, um, than um, is, is likely to last. How do we preserve it more? For instance, I know that at Chebec Colloquium, um, I don't know if it's going to continue, but on the part of, of people like you who are associates of, of Chino Achebe, who, who are directly dealing with the family, what, what are you thinking about? There is no doubt that there will be a perpetuation and permanence of the scholarship, the lucidity, and uh, the historical witness that uh, Professor Achebe uh, has borne to mankind. Uh, there will be, of course, the Achebe Foundation, which is set up uh, in perpetuity in terms of uh, its resource capacity, in terms of uh, the mission. And then there are in excess of 200 million persons who have read some of his more uh, popular books, especially Things Fall Apart. Um, William Shakespeare 
his work still remain relevant uh, to this day. And as you know, Achebe's works are, are very accessible and easy to read. And then that's, that is part of why, uh, for instance, I, I set up achebebooks.com as a repository where people can come with multiple and diverse opinions and perspectives on the man. There is electronic data um, that is being uh, put together every day on the man's works. There are filmic uh, motion images and depictions and recreations of uh, some of his works that will be a part of the continuing efforts to, to keep uh, his uh, work uh, in, in perpetuity. And um, there are conversations. Uh, for instance, uh, seminars, artists like Professor Guibe and others who will do uh, paintings, you know, which represent uh, some of the creative genius of Achebe. And of course, there will be debates like we, we've had about the relevance of his work. And what he has written about Biafra, um, there was a country, is a discussion that will go on for the next 100 years because it is relevant. And the issue about women, which uh, of course uh, I situated clearly that Achebe is a progressive facilitator, a progressive witness on the role of women in traditional African societies. It is not an apology to situate factually, as he has shown, that at the time it was a male-dominated society. That's not an apology to anyone, but an accurate depiction of uh, the history of the time. Uh, the other issue in terms of uh, keeping him, uh, his work relevant, sorry, relevant, is that there are issues that he has raised in several of his works. Some of them are predictive, some of them are post-dictive. And everything that the man has said somehow comes true. He has laid the framework to raise questions about those who committed crimes against humanity in Nigeria and other parts of, of the world. And it is the challenge of the next generation of Nigerians, of Africans, and progressive persons of mankind to say, like the Jews have said, never again. If, but the other thing, lesson about history is that if it, if it has happened once, it can happen again. All right. All right. Chido, thank you so much. Uh, Ologiba, I'll give you 30 seconds, please, to, to give us your final thoughts. Well, you know, on the question of legacy, I think the legacy uh, will last uh, a very long time um, in, in scholarship and uh, continued creativity inspired by his work um, in uh, discourses around the questions that he's uh, raised. And it's particularly uh, uh, telling that he dispatched that very last duty of giving us his story of the Civil War. Mm -hmm. He had to do that. That was the one last thing he had to do. And I am uh, so grateful, and I think so many of us are, that he was able to do that. The legacy will last forever. The name will last forever. It will last in the works. It will last in those of us that he touched personally, not just through the works, but also as, as a man, as a father, as a generous uh, mentor and guardian mm. who uh, accepted so many people into his orbit and raised us. And when he said to me, I came down to see you, now I've seen you, I think I'll retire for the night. I did not recognize that he was having one last look at me and saying to himself, hopefully this generation will carry on out the struggle. Mm. And I hope that we'll be able to dispatch that. It's, a, it's now it's, uh, and it's, it's on us mm. to continue the work. He came, he saw, and he changed the world for the mm. better. Mm. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Gibe. Thank you. Thank you, Chido Wangu, Dr. Chido Wangu. Thank you very much, Rudolph. All right. Um, I hope you enjoyed our discussion. When we come back, we are going to present our shows. Uh, we have Keeping It Real with Adiola and Dr. Damages. Uh, we also have our new show, uh, Africans in the City, which we are going to show you the second episode. So stay tuned. Uh, we'll be right back. <laughs>